Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, it's the day after Labor Day, and for me that means the kids are back to school, and I'm up at the cabin taking advantage of an early goose season. The reason I'm up here today, I'm going to continue working on the cabin. Got the second floor going up with some hemlock beams. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. I've got five beams going across, uh, about nine feet off the ground, and then from there I'm putting on a floor two inch thick floor and then I can build the roof up from that point and I can stand on that so it's going to help me out. Uh, but I really wanted to be up here for early goose season. It, there's uh, so many Canada geese in North America now so a lot of you might not remember when the, when Canada geese weren't all that common. Uh, a number of years ago, I'm not, it's probably 30 years ago now, maybe, maybe a little bit more, they had to reintroduce giant Canadas to southern Ontario so they were becoming extremely rare. That's the goose that you see typically in, in cities and parks and uh, waterfronts everywhere. They just really have become a nuisance. So it's really hard to believe they're they pretty much endangered and had to be reintroduced. So the great thing about them is there's always a lot of discussion about self-reliance, food, and living off the land. Well, that's very hard to do in this day and age. There just isn't the game populations that there, that there was 100, 200, 300 years ago and more. Um, Habitat's just not there. We have so much private land that it's hard to get access to where the actual animals are, uh, where the food sources are. The food sources have become agricultural crops, unfortunately, instead of wild food. So that's been a boon to certain animals like crop-loving animals and, and birds like Canada geese. So in order to manage those populations, the seasons are quite liberal. So one of the great things about that is they provide a lot of food. So one giant Canada goose can go anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds. You can get like five to eight pounds of meat off of one bird. So if you think about that, a typical white-tailed deer in our area, like a doe, for example, yields about 60 pounds of boneless meat. But what that means is that you can harvest Canada geese and put as much meat in the freezer or more than you can by harvesting a big game animal. So let's say I average only five pounds of meat off each of these Canada geese. Well, 12 geese and I've got my 60 pounds of meat. The seasons are so liberal and the bag limits and, and possession limits are so liberal to, to try to call the population. So I can hunt Canada geese up till about December 20th in central Ontario. So that's a long season. That's a lot of food. Um, on top of that, of course, I'm going to add ducks and, and deer and maybe moose and bear meat as well. So I'll get into that in another video. How many calories you can actually legally obtain from wild game in Ontario, Canada. And you can extrapolate that for your region as well. I'm gonna give average yields for all wild animals that you can harvest legally. So stay tuned if you want. I know this video is not for everybody. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't wanna see animals killed, but this is the reality of self-reliance. In my opinion, I'd rather harvest a number of Canada geese, put those in the freezer and cook those up than, uh, than go to the grocery store and buy beef at $20 a pound. Well, these geese that Terry and I shot this morning, I'm gonna process those right now. Typically with game animals, you want them to sit, you want them to rest, they have to cool right down in order for the fibers to start breaking down. So if you eat uh, if you eat any animal while it's still warm, it's gonna be very, very tough. So I'm gonna get these things processed, uh, try to get them in a low spot. I might dig a hole in the ground, get, get them in that, and hopefully I cool the, that carcass down. Then I'm gonna put it on the fire. So not gonna be the most tender. <laughs> Bird of the season.
So the thing about early season geese is that there's a lot of young birds in the population and all the adult birds have just recently molted. So a lot of times the feathers are really hard to get out. You get these little pin feathers which are not fully developed feathers so they don't come out far enough. So they're basically you have to try to use tweezers to pick at them, pull them out. So what I'm going to do first is just test the uh, plucking to see if I can pluck them clean. If not, then I'll probably end up skinning them. The other thing about early season geese is that there's not much fat on them. So they, so we shot these things over a an oat, a harvested oat field. So they were in there actually eating the oat grains. And uh, because they're just starting to do that, they've been on the water up until now, raising their young and and molting. They are not very fat. They just haven't fattened up yet. And sure enough, I can see right through the skin. I can see the meat, which means there's very little to no fat on the breast. And sure enough, it's full of pin feathers. So, I'll show you that. So pin feathers, see they're not developed, that's the beginning of a feather starting to emerge. And uh, there's just so many of them. I'm going to end up skinning these things and then later in the season when the f geese are fatter I'll render some of that fat down and also keep the skin on a bunch of the birds and, and roast them because they are more tasty that way. It's just that that would take literally, uh, you know, hours and hours to pluck that bird and still wouldn't get them all and it wouldn't taste good as a result. So I'm going to skin these out. I'm going to keep these wings for training Callie. It's a good size. She can get uh, the scent off of this thing. I can tie it to her training dummy and I can throw that for her. And she can learn to start tracking by scent and retrieving by scent. So I'll keep those. That's the first goose process, but I just thought of something. I'm not going to show that in this video. How many times do you have to see a, a bird being processed? I'm going to put a couple of links in the description below or in the pinned comment to other videos that I've done where I show the whole process. One in particular, I went to a friend's farm last summer or the summer before and we processed some uh, turkeys, some butchered, slaughtered, you know, not going to sugarcoat it. We did the whole thing. So we. Uh, killed uh, turkeys and geese and uh, plucked them and, and skinned them and cut them up into pieces and then cooked them. So take a look at that video. You're going to learn all you need to know about uh, cleaning waterfowl and any kind of fowl for that matter from those videos. No point to upsetting YouTube and upsetting people who want to watch the self-reliance part of these videos. It's there. I'm not being a, I'm not being a sissy about this. I just don't see the purpose of it continuing to show the same process. It's a little bit gory for some people. I think everybody should see it. So I really encourage you to go to those videos. Actually, I've got a duck video too where I completely show the processing of a mallard last uh, fall. So check out those videos. So in this video, let's just stick to the basics of self-reliance. I'm up at the cabin, shot some geese, processing them. Go to those other videos, see how to process them, and then just come back and, uh, and watch this uh, and watch how I utilize these geese. So I'm gonna cook these a couple of different ways today. So sorry about that if you're looking for that in this video, but like I said, not big, no big deal to go click on those videos and watch those quickly. They're pretty entertaining in their own right anyway. One of the three geese ended up being pretty mature and the feathers came out pretty good. There's a bunch of pin feathers but nowhere near as bad as that other one. So I'm actually going to leave this one, leave the skin on this one. So it's pretty decently plucked and now I'm going to singe the feathers off of it. Singe the fe uh, pin feathers. So I'm just going to hold it over the fire and spin it around. And then I'm going to hang it from the uh, top of the tripod here. 
and just let it slow roast and smoke for the rest of the day while I work on the cabin. I'll have to let that die down a little bit, but anyway, that'll be good for singeing, so I'll just monitor it closely. Wood's so wet, we had, he said we were going to get three or four inches here of rain yesterday. I'm not sure what we ended up getting, but it sure did rain a lot. But all the wood is soaked, so that's why I had all the hardwood kind of piled up around the outside to dry it out. Now just kind of pushing it in. Let's uh, singe these feathers off. Just about do it. There's not much, if any, feathers left on there now. So now I'll let that fire die down to some coals and I'll hang it up high. Let it roast slowly. Stick some uh, my good old Montreal keg spice on there. Yeah, that's good. So it's good. Whew, smoky. That's good. It's uh, see, there's no feathers left on there at all. Now I'm going to stick that spice on there and I can throw that on the fire. That will be a nice meal. It's too much for me, but I can take it home. It'll actually preserve it. It'll make it last longer. It's like, what is it? 18 degrees, 17 degrees Celsius out today. And it's only going down to, I think, 10 tonight. So all this meat could start to go off a little bit. So I'm going to cook it all. That'll preserve it. And then I can uh, freeze some of it when I get home and heat up the rest just heat it up to another 180 degrees to kill any parasites and it'll be good kill any bacteria no fire poker I need a poker Really haven't cut much firewood on the property yet, so all this this uh, hard stuff is maple, but it's from a tree that fell a few years ago, so a lot of it's punky. I need to uh, cut some of this drier stuff off, get it stored under under shelter, so I can burn it all winter up at the camp. Got some students coming up at the end of October, and in the wood stove, of course. Plus we've got a few shelters around the property. We've got that Adirondack shelter that Joe and I did back in what March. Haven't been back to it. I haven't even seen it actually since we built it. So I should go back and check that out. Get back there and finish that up. Uh, get some firewood stacked by that that uh, shelter as well. Is this tripod's good. I'm thinking it could be bigger. I think I think this tri tripod will end up at a smaller fire up at the camp. I want a big, maybe higher tripod up about that high so I can put a good sized cauldron hanging from it. Cook up some big meals and probably do my maple syrup on this fire next spring as well. Or winter, late winter. Let's try this out. Beautiful. Flip that over in a bit. That's breast side up right now. Cook the back and then I'll flip it over and cook the breast slower when that fire dies down a little bit. I want that to be the most tender part. This uh, pot is just an old pot that my parents picked up at a garage sale, so you, it's really rusted I see now, and it's not um, seasoned at all. So I'm going to put these 
two breasts with the uh, skin and the fat face down so that it uh, greases the pan a little bit. But then I'm going to fill it with water anyway and just simmer these things and then I'll roast them or grill them or barbecue them after they're actually cooked <clears throat> just to give them a nice char on the outside. Usually do it the opposite way, but don't really have a grill set up yet on this part of the campsite. This part of the cabin. Got a couple of the heart hearts as well. Let this brine a little bit with that salt, and pepper, and other spices on there, and then I'll put it on that hang. I'll suspend it from the tripod once that first goose is done. But uh, I don't need it to cook for that long, so I might as well wait till that one's done anyway. Uh, it's a good height off the, off the fire, so it's cooking really slowly, which is good. We should get back to the cabin. I'm gonna let that brine for a while, like I said. That's uh, I'm gonna flip that over shortly. I would say another hour and that thing will be done. Stick that on there, let it simmer, simmer right, I think right till bedtime, then I'll put it somewhere safe so the bears don't come in and get it. And then uh, probably throw it back on and have that for lunch tomorrow. Well, I'm sitting here waiting for dinner to cook. I want to talk about my knives quickly. You might notice I, you might notice I use a lot of different knives depending on what I'm doing. Uh, today I've got two with me. Not necessarily because I need to, but because I had my reliable old uh, Puma in my truck. And I just pulled it out because I was going to do some batoning. But I wanted to show you this knife I got from Virtus. Uh, Virtus Knives in Saskatchewan. Sam Pellabroda, the owner. Uh, nice young guy from, like I said, Saskatchewan, Canada. Makes these knives. I first saw this particular knife. I think it was the Virtus. I think it was the Traveler on Far North Bushcraft and Survival. Lonnie was giving one of these away. I think the one he was giving away might have had brass inserts, which I really like. Gives it a knife, a, gives that knife a really good heft, a good weight to it. Uh, but anyway, I decided to get this one from, from Sam. It's uh, the Traveler, like I said. It's the narrower, the point, uh, narrower point than the other one that he has. He's got a, a Utilis as well, which has got a thicker blade right to the point. I really was looking for a knife to do some bushcraft work, some, some woodworking around the fire and, and up at the camp. So this one fit perfectly. It's eight and a half inches overall. It's four and a half inch handle, four inch blade. Like I said, it's a narrow point. Got three 30 seconds steel. It's hardened to 58 to 60 HRC. I've been putting it to the test, trying to bend that blade and it's really holding up pretty well. Has uh, mosaic pins, the three eighths, lanyard tube, uh, blue blue liners with the, the black liner to fill in the gaps where it did some cool uh, full tang um, full tang barbed wire file work in, in here in, in the tang here. Nice pommel, it's pretty pretty uh, sharp, really good 90 degree back to the knife, uh, throw some great sparks and yeah it's uh, just a comfortable little knife I really like it. I, I, Surprise! I've never actually had a knife like this. I usually have a different kind of grind. I, I do a lot of hunting and fishing, as you know, so I use specialty blades for that that, uh, that I end up using for other purposes as well. Uh, one of them, I'll show you the, the Puma that I normally carry and why I carry it. But as far as uh, doing work around the fire or even the cabin, one of the reasons I like this one, I, I don't like plastic or uh, G10 you know, full handle full scale. I like uh, I like a more traditional looking knife with wood. I usually don't even like the liners but I think this one looks pretty cool. Uh, so this one's curly maple and it's a light gray stain on it so I think it's pretty cool. I'm going to use this a lot up here at the camp. It's been holding an edge really well too. I've really put it through the through the ringer. So that's the main knife that I'm using. Uh, Kydex sheath. Nice tight fit on it and it's on a dangler. I put it behind that loop so that I'm not uh, getting it you know, if you have it in the front, especially a regular traditional sheath, you got it in the front there and you're sitting down, it's always digging in, especially if you're slipping on rain pants or, or winter pants, which we'll, we'll be doing soon enough. So I always hang it back there, but it's a nice tight fit. I think what I'll probably do is attach a lanyard to the sheath at the top and I feed it through the lanyard tube. 
So I don't tie it to the knife. I don't tie the lanyard to the knife. I just slip it through on a loop and then I slip it back over top of the sheath just to hold it in place uh, for when I'm canoeing or something because I don't want, I don't trust uh, an open sheath that's going to hold the knife when I'm going down through uh, rough water or something. So anyway, that's the uh, that's a great new knife. I'm uh, said what's that? Yeah, July, August, September now, three months. I think I put it through good enough tests that I was finally willing and able to talk about it. I don't like promoting products that that I'm not a fan of and that I haven't put through the test. So I get lots of people sending me stuff or asking to send me stuff and if it's not something I believe in I just don't do it. So check out Sam's website. It's uh, virtusknives.com. Got a great Facebook feed and uh, Instagram feed as well so check them out there. I think you'll be surprised at the prices. They're pretty reasonable. His knife prices range from about 220 bucks up to about five, 495 and that's Canadian. So you, you Americans of course can uh, save another 25% off of that right now. For the foreseeable future, I would say the, the exchange rate's not going anywhere in our favor. Uh, so, like I said, check them out. I also want to show you this knife because you see me carrying this quite often and you might wonder why. You don't see too many people carrying these things, even though this company's been around forever and it's, you know, it's a pretty uh, robust, good quality knife. This is the Puma White Hunter. And the reason I carry it is because for sentimental reasons. My dad got one and I don't know my mom bought it for him. I think she might have back in I want to say 70 or 72 which is I think when they first started with this model. Yeah. And he didn't do much hunting. He did a little bit of deer hunting so I don't think he used the knife all that much but when I got into my little bushcrafty stuff when I was a young teenager probably probably 12 years old I took it out to the forest all the time and I lost it. Um, wasn't happy. I don't think he was too happy, but although he never really gave me too much of a hard time about it. I just felt really bad, so I ended up replacing it maybe 10 years later. And then I bought myself one in my early 20s, and somebody stole that. I'm pretty sure I know who it was, but anyway, that was gone. And then uh, I think my wife might have got me another one. And then I went and bought, and then that one was, then I lost that one, I think, on a moose hunting trip or a caribou hunting trip. So I ended up buying myself another one in the last five years. You know, it's not a not a cheap knife, so it's a bit painful to keep doing that. That's uh, 500 bucks Canadian, I think. So, like I said, mostly sentimental reasons. Not the most practical design. Has some cool features, and I do use those features. And when I am, it's probably one of the better knives to do it. On the back of it, instead of a 90 degree spine, it has a chopping blade, a dull chopping blade, and a flat spot here that you can actually pound quite easily. You see a nice wide flare on it. Good grip right there. It's got a little bit of bone cutting serration right here on the uh, base of the blade. It's, it's uh, got a stag horn handle, brass rivets, and a brass lanyard too. So I think it looks cool. It's, like I said, I'm not sure how practical it is. It's hard to sharpen because it's got such a sweep here. It goes from narrow, so it's kind of so it's kind of concave here and then convex here. It's got this little micro grind along the edge here, so it's pretty hard to get that on a jig even and sharpen it. So you usually can't get through skinning a full deer or bear or, or certainly not a moose without doing an actual sharpening job, not just a straw. Uh, but when I am processing something like a caribou or a, or a moose or even a bear, I like the heft of that and the thickness and strength of that blade. I, I can actually cut right through the pelvic bone and split the animal wide open so I can get the entrails out and get that carcass open for cooling. So it's a good knife for that. So for that reason, I carry it. Like I said, it's good for doing some heavy, heavy work around the campsite. Something I wouldn't want to put the, uh, the vertus through. It's just too small a knife, and it's perfect for its purposes, but it's not, but it's just completely different than this knife, and I'd use it for completely different reasons. So those are the two knives I'm carrying for the most part these days, and I'll probably continue. Um, you'll likely see me with my Puma Catamount 2 later in the season, the hunting season, because that's more specific, and it's a very good knife for skinning deer. Likely going to see some fresh deer sign down here. I put a couple out here. I'm pretty sure I'll get a deer up here this year and maybe a bear um, and maybe even a moose. We'll see. And if not, I'll get a deer at least down in, uh, in southern Ontario. So that's my two main knives for those people who have been asking and if you have any questions about 
these knives or any of my other ones just uh, comment below and I'll get back to you. In the meantime, don't forget to check out Virtus Knives online and just uh, let them know I sent you. I'm going to flip this thing over. I haven't done much work on this cabin. I need to get back up on the second floor there and start pounding some boards together before I have to set up uh, my bed in there. I'm actually going to sleep inside the cabin this time. Let's see what this thing looks like. Use this stuff once or twice. A good old rival keg spice. I don't know if it's much different than what everybody else calls a Montreal steak spice. Probably got one or two different spices, or maybe it's just more uh, more of one than than other regular Montreal steak spice. So a lot of salt, garlic, um, onion, pepper, and fennel. That's the only things I can for sure identify. Okay enough. I think what I'll do is hang the pot. Hang the pot. Hang the pot. How am I gonna hang the pot? Let's see now. Tasty. Alright, so I'm gonna keep the uh I wanna keep this goose up here because it's not I don't think it's quite done probably in the middle so I'm gonna hang the uh, I'm gonna hang the pot from the chain anyway yeah that's fine I can just drip into the pot add some more flavor it's going to be nice to have that cabin on and have things. As much as I like camping, when I'm out in the bush this often, like up in central Ontario, nice to have something more comfortable than a tent all the time or a bivy. So it, what I'm talking about is utensils, cloths, somewhere to wash your hands. Like That's going to be awesome when that's finished. i got to get my butt in gear and get that done in the next, uh, I'd say in the next month, I'd like it to be 100%. Roof on, floor in, wood stove in. It'll be the end of September, which means October, when the uh, leaves are at full peak color and all the games moving around. I can be up here hunting. I want to be just here enjoying the place instead of building it. Although I'll always have some projects to go to work on, I'm sure. Oh, I know I will because I have tons of plans for this place. So it's going to finish. Uh, Finish this one last beam. Weepy eyes from that smoke. Plus, I got up at uh, 2:45 this morning to make the drive up to that goose hunt. So, gonna be an early night. Anyway, got this the way I want it. That so can uh, simmer for the rest of the night. I'm gonna jump up on top of the cabin here and finish off that last beam. And then I'll set up a tarp for the night to sleep in the cabin. And then tomorrow I'm going to finish off all those last, uh, the last course of the walls. And then I, sometime later this week I can start working on the roof. That's going to be exciting. Too hot. Settle that fire down a bit. Good thing about a nice sized fire pit when you have a tripod like this is that you can keep moving the fire around the outside and just push the coals in under the pot. That's way too hot in the center right now. Could raise that up, I guess. Get some more water in there at least. Thirteen. I think it's 
sun sets just after seven. So I think what I'll do is uh, I'm gonna add some jambalaya to this. I, that's what I had originally brought for dinner, not knowing if I was gonna shoot anything. So I'm gonna add that to this big pot of, of uh, stewing um, goose here. Even if I don't eat that tonight, it'd be awesome tomorrow, and then I can cut some chunks off of that. But anyway, I think what I'll do first, though, is to get my bed set up, because if that sun sets, it makes it a lot more difficult to get get to bed arranged in the in the dark. I'm going to be sleeping in the cabin, but because it's calling for rain tonight, and there's no roof on yet, I'm actually going to put a put a tarp over that. Probably just sleep in a sleeping bag with no bivy on me. So I got, got what I wanted to get done today. I got the last of the floor trusses up for the second floor. So now I can start uh, putting a floor on there and then building up to the roof level. But uh, I'm looking forward to this goose. I'm getting pretty hungry actually. I called this jambalaya, but I guess missing a few ingredients. There's no ham or, uh, there's no ham or shrimp in this one. So I have rice, tomato sauce, onions, um, some fresh tomatoes out of the garden, lots of garlic, pork sausage from some pigs that my sister raised, and chicken. So I'll throw that in the pot and uh, that uh, tomato sauce being acidic is going to help break down the fibers in this uh, goose since it wasn't aged properly. So I'll throw this in here and then I'll set up my bed and then come back and eat and then sit around the fire probably for a while before heading off to bed. Maybe do some reading on my phone, read some uh, Alone in the Wilderness. Should have brought an actual book. I actually had one on the counter and ended up leaving it. And now I regret it. Ooh, that's hot. That's going to help break down that goose nicely. Too bad it's calling for rain tonight. I wouldn't bother setting this tarp up otherwise. Nice to have the four walls around me, it's, but the wind calmed right down and it's actually quite comfortable in here. Just, uh, of course, there's no roof, so if it rains, I'm gonna get soaked and so is my gear. So I'm gonna set this tarp up up in the rafters here. And I'll set up a sleeping bag and sleeping pad, I guess, right here. Yeah, I think that'll work. Get up in the morning, get the fire going again, and get to work on uh, that last course of logs. This is actually a tarp that my wife Joe, Robinette and I have been designing. This is a sample that we had manufacture out of a parachute material. It's really really light and, and small, compacts really small. A couple of minor things we're going to do to strengthen up the seams I think and maybe put another coating of waterproofing on the underside. Uh, but I am really happy with it. I did a test had it hanging from the cabin when it was lower uh, across like this and filled it with water and just to test the tear strength, the seams and the waterproof and, uh, and how waterproof it was and I was really happy with the results. So obviously we're not going to get a blue tarp made and like I said there's a few minor changes we need to do so once we're happy with the final product we'll put it on the websites and start selling it. But I'm really looking forward to it because it's hard to find a good 10 by 10 uh, tarp that's versatile, I like a square type, it's more versatile. It's hard to get one that's exactly 10 by 10 with the right tie outs in the center of the tarp as well. And nice color, lightweight, and at a reasonable price. So I'm thinking probably another month or two. In the meantime, we had a bunch more of those little grills made up. We've got two of them here actually that I've been using. Set up a big, bigger, more permanent grill, of course, for the for the once the cabin's done. But I'm going to keep using that little grill for the canoe trips and backpacking trips. So those are going back up on the website. Should be available next week. Give it a try. I 
like I expected it's pretty tough but it's really really tasty so I'm happy with it but it needs more time on the fire holy that is really tasty actually smoky combined with the salt and the fat from the goose man that is so good maybe I'll try one of these try one of these uh, wings might be a little bit more cooked in the front here let's see where it's been lowered to the end of the fire yeah that's beautiful nice fresh goose that is so good if you've never had Canada goose and most people haven't, or a lot of people haven't at least. A lot of people don't even know that you can hunt Canada geese because it's called Canada goose. People in Canada think you can't shoot them and because they're at the parks. But getting a Canada goose, getting a goose of any kind in the past when you were duck hunting was a real bonus. It was a, you know, something you really strived for and you were lucky to get one in a year. Now there's so many of them, people think of them like rats, but there's nothing wrong with a wild goose up here they're actually quite wild when they're up in the you know more of the wilderness areas and think about um, the limits that I talked about before the bag limits and, and the possession limits and how many you could harvest in a year and how many of your annual calories could you get from geese I mean there's obviously lots of other game that you're gonna harvest but ducks are a little bit harder to get you know if you get uh, five ducks, six ducks, and then have a possession limit of five or twelve, depending on where you are. They don't provide as much meat, obviously, but they're also, they migrate earlier, um, the season starts later, and it's just hard to get into a whole bunch of them. They're harder to hit or when you're hunting them. So these geese are a really, really good self-reliant food. They're a good source of calories for somebody who's trying to live a self-reliant lifestyle. I would add Canada geese to your rabbits and your um, to your rabbits, your other waterfowl, deer, uh, bear, moose, all the game up here that you can harvest plus fish that you put together, it's going to give you enough calories. It's going to give you enough protein calories and fat calories at least for the year. Without geese, I think you would have a hard time getting enough calories from the wild, at least protein and fat in the f form of uh, wild animals. You know, you need to get a moose, at least one moose. You need to get deer, you need to get bear or you get a whole ton of wild geese. Now if I could just tenderize that, so tasty, like can't even explain to you, you have to try it, you have to try it. So I'm just gonna eat a little bit more of this and I start thinking about maybe going down and get some photographs of the sunset and hopefully hear some wolves tonight. It'd be nice to uh, capture them again. Yeah, that looks like it's going to be beautiful. But I'm hungry, I'm gonna stay here I think and Cut up some bread and dip it into the jambalaya. This chicken sausage. Tomatoes, onions, garlic. I think that's it. And rice. Well, I am ready for bed. That was a great day, though. It's a long day. Started at 3 o'clock in the morning getting ready for goose hunting. Went out with Terry and had a great shoot. Not great shooting, but lots of geese came in. Got some work done on the cabin. I'm going to get up early tomorrow morning and get to work up here. I want to get that top course on and then. Uh, into the roof and I need to start hewing some boards and, and uh, beams for the for the peak I'm going to use do a log gable so I so it'll continue this up about five feet higher uh, on a peak then I'll have a ridge and then two uh, interim uh, beams ridge poles as well and then I'm going to frame that with like two inch thick wood all the way down not frame I'm going to board a two inch thick wood all the way down, maybe four inches for insulation value. So lots of work, but getting there, I'm excited to get, do that part. It's actually going to go pretty quick once I get the gable ends done. The roof itself should go fairly quick 
and then I can get a, uh, get it waterproof. So yeah, like I said, I think a month and see how many days I can string together. Anyway, it's pretty exciting. Great light in here and it's blocking the wind. It's actually a little bit warm now even. So I hope you enjoyed that one guys. It's the beginning of hunting season. I'm going to be doing a lot of that in order to put some meat in the freezer for the family and I'm going to continue to work on this cabin. Hopefully by uh, the time the snow flies in a month or two I've got the uh, roof on this thing, got it closed in, got the wood stove roaring and be cooking our meals here while I hunt in the surrounding forest and, and uh, then we'll get into some ice fishing. So I've got lots of stuff going on this year. I'm glad to finally have this cabin to do this from and can't wait to uh, get a cellar built here and get some meat stored on the property and, and some other food. So we can spend a hell of a lot more time up here. So thanks for watching this video, guys. Hope you enjoyed that one. I'll see you in the next one.